uh, we're going to jump right back in uh, now for a panel discussion with uh, Shrikan Patathil from Harbinger Group, Kim Stewart from First Citizens Bank, and Clive Wright from edX. Uh, they're going to be talking about a really timely topic today, how to use online learning uh, to create an agile upskilling program that aligns with business priorities. And rather than having me take up a bunch of time, uh, good content time with uh, with introductions, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce the moderator, and then we'll turn it over for some uh, for some great content. Moderating Trikan Patathil again uh, from Harbinger Group, and he's uh, developed innovations in formulating sound technical approaches uh, to business problems that are consistently appreciated uh, by the customers. And his solutions have ranged from development frameworks, data architectures, schema designs, all to test strategies for applications for thin client, rich client, and desktop. Uh, without further ado, Shrikan, go ahead and uh, take it away. Thanks, Bobby. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, to be on this panel and uh, with my co-panelists as well. So before I start, I would like to share uh, any, a story which happened about eight months back. We are a mid-sized company, about uh, thousand, less than 1,000 people, and we are into providing training, learning solutions, building frameworks, uh, developing e-learning courses, and so forth. And uh, we have a lot of e-learning, do a lot of e-learning ourselves. So around about um, the time the lockdown happened and everybody went, uh, uh, you know, remote, uh, we, we thought that we were covered and we had a lot of online programs and our e-learning was probably, uh, you know, will cover us for our training. But my capability team guy came to me and said that, you know what, people do learn online, but actually the lot of learning happens when they are together, when they see each other, engineers work with together, they observe and that's where the learning happens. And I don't think our learning programs do that by themselves. And when they're remote, that aspect is gone. So we need to relook at our whole learning program and relook at how we do online learning so that, you know, if this is going to continue for a longer period, then we need to do, we need to revamp and do, do a lot more. So that's what my interest in this topic is. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, to moderate this and uh, with my panelists, like ask them questions and, you know, get their insights and share my uh, experiences as well. So on that note, let me welcome uh, our panelists, uh, Kim Stewart, uh, Senior Vice President, Head of Talent Management for Citizen Bank and Clive Wright, VP Academy, Academic and Enterprise Solutions uh, from edX. Um, why don't I invite Kim to share a little bit about yourself and uh, what is your interest in this in this topic and then we'll move to Clive. Great, thank you so much and good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Kim Stewart and um, I work for First Citizens Bank. We are a national um, bank. We are headquartered out of Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, we are actually um, the largest family controlled bank in the United States. Um, we have um, actually though, just announced a merger with CIT Group and um, that uh, will about double us in size um, when we um, close that transaction sometime in second quarter next year. So we're currently about 7,000 employees. When that transaction closes, we'll be 11,000 employees. And I think we're going to be in 24, 25 states um, overall. So um, traditional um, banking, if you think about going into a branch and um, cashing a check, if anybody even does that these days, um, with our merger, CIT will bring um, an additional opportunity in businesses around rail and aviation and, um, you know, shipping, uh, you know, via boat as, as well. So definitely some interesting times. And um, because we are in such a distributed network, we have 550 branches um, around the country. Um, you know, not only the online and virtual opportunity is critical for us to um, just keep up with demand and, um, you know, reaching people in a timely manner, um, but 
specifically the question on upskilling, um, the need for um, new skills and skill acquisition changes so quickly um, that I think it's um, definitely one of those dilemmas that we're all dealing with in this profession on how do we keep up with the pace um, and then offer learning opportunities for our employees um, to help build the skills, not only for what they're doing now, but you know, what do we need them to be doing two years from now, three years from now, and sometimes we don't even know that. So that's my interest in um, this topic and certainly don't have all the answers. So looking forward to um, great participation from the other participants as well. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Clay? Yes, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, so Clive Wright from edX. Um, edX, as you probably know, is a, a consumer uh, driven and corporate driven uh, organization, really at the heart of online learning. Uh, that was really how we were founded by MIT and Harvard in 2012, to really solve for um, mass appeal that was, was being generated as a consumer and as organizations to really upskill, to learn new skills as individuals, as well as for their career pathways, their learning pathways. So what edX has done is worked with over 150 of the top organizations that provide learning, put it onto this instructional design platform created by the McGovern Institute at MIT to really identify the best possible practices of learning online. So my role at edX is really to, to build solutions, is to build workforce scale upskilling solutions. So my team is really focused on partnering with you as L&D leaders to identify what kind of pathways, what kind of outcomes, what kind of agility, what kind of subjects are most interesting to you, your departments, your divisions across the world. So I'm really here just to lend a hand to share experiences that we found working with these large enterprises to solve for uh, employee upskilling. Thanks, Clive. I think uh, we have a very interesting uh, panel. Uh, uh, Kim, who is on the, who is an expert in talent management and, had, and has managed large organizations, and you who have provided solutions to large organizations uh, through the edX uh, platform. I'm sure uh, as we move through the discussions, we'll be, there'll be interesting uh, topics that, uh, that we can discuss further. Moving further, uh, today's plan, there's a lot to talk about online learning, but uh, as a part of our next uh, 30 to 40 minutes, we thought that there'll be four aspects that we cover. One is about using online learning for agile upskilling programs, why, why that is necessary, we'll, we'll touch upon that. Then we'll also talk about you know, the delivery methods that uh, organizations have used and what may work uh, when you're uh, building online learning. Uh, another important aspect when, you, when we all do online learning, move away from classroom, is that uh, how to enable engagement and collaboration. And, and we will we'll share some uh, thoughts on that. And finally, I think for all businesses, what matters is how, how does it deliver ROI? What kind of analytics uh, are we collecting? And is it really making a business uh, change? And is it really impactful? So we'll, we'll try to cover this. Uh, it's a lot to cover. Uh, and there are many more other things uh, that, uh, that are here. And I'm sure audience will have some questions as well. So, so let's uh, deep dive into our first topic, which is about the need for online learning and agile upskilling programs. We all know, and we are in interesting times right now. Uh, and we, there have been many surveys done. And one of the important things that have come out is not all organizations, and probably 90% of the organizations out there are going to have a lot of workforce that's going to be remote. And therefore, learning um, and their whole approach towards upskilling is going to change. So, so they need to work on online learning. So my first question uh, to Clive is that, what is the advice you have uh, for companies uh, to create uh, an agile upskilling program? So, yeah, so um, a lot of the sessions over the last uh, day and a half have really 
touching upon the first one, the first thing that I would do when you're building these programs for upskilling is start with the, the end game in mind, the outcomes. What does success look like? So that is, is really about doing a, an audit across your departments of what skills do they have right now? What are working? The leadership skills, the product knowledge, those sorts of things. So you have that kind of level set, but also identify which skills do you have now, but really need a little bit more. And that could be some of the process skills, could be agile, could be lean, Six Sigma, that sort of thing. Those are the common things that most companies, doesn't matter what vertical that they're in, are really looking to increase. So kind of build with the outcome, we need to increase those skills and jot them down, have, have them as a list that you can look at the return of investment. And the third one, of course, is what you hear a lot of these conferences about this fourth industrial revolution, about those Gartner reports, the McKinsey reports that talk about 94% of the workplace don't have the skills that they'll need for the, uh, the needs of 2030. So those are the sorts of things, the skills that you're looking for, the AI, the big data, the machine learning, those sorts of skills that you need to upskill that workforce. So really do genuinely have some kind of reference of where you're starting and then build this three to five year plan. One of the biggest mistakes that a lot of people have fed back to us is we really didn't think big enough. We really didn't feel that this was worth doing at scale. And that's typically how it fails. You really need to think about every single employee. One of my favorite stories is where the L&D person was talking about um, this equity, this parity across the workforce and how important it was to give every single person the opportunity to have two, three, four courses in any given year for their own pathway. And what I really liked about that is how they talked about it, about diversifying their portfolio. It was a really interesting kind of investment conversation of investing in their employees because you can have one or two or five or 12 of those tens of thousands of employees that you represent, just you need one or two of them to come up with an idea, an execution, a feature, a, a widget, whatever it is that they're working on to really make large impacts. And when you're building these programs, make sure everyone has that opportunity to have two or three courses within that framework of, of upskilling. So, Outcomes, audit, and then think big. Um, and, and really think about the quality that sits behind those programs to make sure that all that time that they're investing over that three to five year plan is worthwhile. Uh, again, one of those reports, I think it was the Gartner one that was talking about 50% of L&D people kind of regretted that the training program that they went through. So spend time up front looking at these different possibilities that you have for upskilling and really spend time making sure that that half an hour session each week or each fortnight is really capturing the best use of their time, that they'll have some kind of impact, this agility, this engagement, um, this blended environment. Those are sorts of things that go big or go home, as, as a lot of the, the Americans would tell me. <laughs> Those are very interesting tips, the way you've approached it in steps. And I think uh, that really makes sense uh, if somebody's trying to create an agile uh, upskilling program. So uh, let me go uh, now to Kim. And I think uh, you're running a pretty large uh, organization and managing so many uh, branches. And uh, of course, uh, be being a bank, probably there was a lot of in-person learning that was happening. Now, if let's say there was a craving towards doing more in-person in learning. Do you think there is going to be another shift in this whole delivery methods? What's your kind of thought on that? It's interesting. We've been having that conversation um, internally in preparation for 2021. And um, both from a budgeting standpoint, but a resource standpoint, and, um, you know, right now with this pandemic, numbers are going in the wrong direction. So I think we might be sliding back a little bit, maybe, um, you know, quite a, you know, no, you know, number of additional months that we might be in the situation of delivering um, in a virtual environment versus um, in person. So I think initially when there's finally a break 
um, in this, there will be a craving for um, some um, human interaction, some live human interaction in person. We're, we're talking about in our company around how do you fight the Zoom fatigue. And um, interestingly, we just had our annual leadership meeting yesterday. It's always a two and a half day event in person. And we did a two hour virtual leadership meeting um, instead. So um, with that said, in that initial spike, um, our gut is that it'll settle back down. And while I don't think in-person will ever completely go away, I don't know that it will return to pre-COVID levels. Because at this point, um, you know, people have gotten used to the platforms, they've gotten more comfortable being on camera, uh, even being on camera in, you know, a ball hat and not in work clothes and not being as self-conscious about that. Um, I think they've appreciated not having to travel, um, you know, which for our production associates is critical because, you know, if they're in a car, they're on a plane, that's less time that they have to generate revenue, service our customers. And so they've really appreciated that aspect. So, um, you know, all, all of that said, you know, our kind of one lighter, one, kind of one liner summary to, to, you know, what we predict will happen is, you know, an initial spike and coming back in the classroom, but we think that'll probably quickly fall back down to, hey, what if we go back to this virtual environment where, you know, I don't have to be away from home, work, the office as often, and um, the, the additional caveat I'll add to that is we already had the new generations coming into the workforce who were incredibly digitally savvy in, um, you know, wanting to use a device, want an answer now, um, don't necessarily want to go sit in, you know, a one week, two week, three week course, um, you know, and now they're going to have had it had at least a year, if not a year and a half of complete virtual delivery. So um, I have one in college, I have one in high school, and, you know, they are definitely feeling the effects of the social um, isolation, um, but they, uh, I had one that had the, uh, the option just this week to go back hybrid and elected to stay virtual. And so I thought it was a very interesting, interesting choice. Well, thanks, Kim. Thanks for those thoughts. And I agree with you that uh, it will not uh, go back to pre-COVID times in terms of the in-person learning, but there will be a good blend and mix of uh, you know, online. And now that people are used to it almost for a year, I think uh, organizations will leverage that uh, in, in a positive way. So, so that's, uh, that uh, brings us to the next topic of our discussion, which is, uh, which is leveraging multiple delivery methods. Now that we know that online learning and how to do agile upskilling programs uh, using online learning and approaches for that, uh, let's dive a little bit deeper into, you know, what kind of delivery methods may be relevant um, and what's what's the panelist's experience there. So let me ask uh, Clive the first question about, uh, you know, we hear a lot about micro learning and you coming from edX, <laughs> I think uh, you probably design courses that run pretty long because they are people studying a specific topic and so forth. So how do they complement or go hand in hand with each other? What, what's your thoughts? Yes, a really, really good question. Thank you. Um, the trick is to make sure that there is a combination. You cannot expect anyone to sit on a, a two hour lecture, uh, whether you're in person or, uh, or remote. <laughs> and uh, Kim made a really good point about you know, kind of this Zoom, um, just utter, um, I, I spend at least eight to nine hours on Zoom and it drives me crazy, let alone the students and, and the employees. So what we're trying to do to really shift away from this kind of synchronous Zoom experience to really make it valuable and, and impactful is think about how you combine components, micro learning, have a two minute, three minute video from a, a world leader who can really speak to and instruct and inform in their subjects and keep this pattern of, of repetition and uh, expansion in those different subjects. So you might have an MIT professor talking about computer science, but rather than do it in one fell swoop, they'll do it in these bite-sized, absorbable, digestible components. 
And each time you have one of those digestible micro sessions, which is kind of an asynchronous, just in time, do it before work, lunchtime, after work, weekends, doesn't matter. You are then given some kind of either diagnostic or formative or summative assessment that goes with that. You've got it well done. You feel good. You feel motivated to go to the next two minute chunk. And you can start and stop and, and build those uh, different experiences throughout your working week. So what we're trying to do is build this engagement, this active, deep learning through the, uh, the eight hours, 16 hours, 32 hours, all of these courses are running different lengths. So that the learner, the department head, the L&D people get to see that they're really genuinely absorbing this transformational information. So what we're really expecting people to do is walk out of those courses, not only with this beautiful certificate that goes behind your screen in your Zoom calls that, hey, I've just got a Harvard certificate, aren't I great? And have that real motivation and humble bragging rights, but you, now you're applying it. So all of those courses that I'm talking about, the Python courses, the AI courses, the leadership courses are geared towards application in your workplace. I've taken the Wharton course and I'm, I'm currently doing the Leaders of Learning course at Harvard. And all the time they're talking about in your environment, with your peers, with your learners, with your employees, whatever the context mm -hmm. is, and that is how the micro learning and this deep learning really sticks. So that, that's, the, that's the, uh, the kind of the pedagogical instructional design component. Keep it short, keep it accessible, keep it discoverable and make it impactful and absorbable. Makes sense. I think people should take a few edX courses to kind of understand how it works and maybe then design mm -hmm. their own uh, content in that format. So I think that would be quite interesting. Uh, let me move to Kim and uh, I know she has experience blending uh, different forms of synchronous and asynchronous uh, learning to deliver uh, training. Uh, so how have you done that and what have you been, what has been your experience? There? We have, um, I, I'm going to hone in just on a particular program, kind of give you some examples. Um, this was actually a program that pre-COVID we were delivering in a two or three day in person. So, you know, lots of breaks, but lots of, um, you know, kind of tr triad um, activities, um, group activities. And, you know, one of the things that we had to figure out, obviously, when COVID hit is how and we had gathering restrictions and travel restrictions, how can we recreate an experience in, you know, not death by Zoom, death by PowerPoint, as Clive um, indicated, but how can we create something that um, is, is engaging, it doesn't give them the fatigue, and actually it may give them a um, a better opportunity for practice and application than even what we would have done in the two or three day in-person course. And so um, the particular example that we have is around sales enablement, um, changing the conversation with the client, um, because obviously huge economic swings and, and changes with um, the pandemic. And um, as, as Clive mentioned, I mean, we had micro lessons, we had online um, learning lessons, um, you know, we uh, would have, um, you know, video recordings, and you don't have to have a big studio, you don't have to go out and hire a big video editing company, um, you know, again, um, the younger generations coming into the workforce are used to YouTube, um, so we call it YouTube quality, um, right? It doesn't have to be, um, you know, completely um, perfect produced experience, but, you know, hey, let me, you know, get, get on WebEx, um, interview someone, have a panel like this, record snippets of it, drop that into your, um, you know, your online development software, um, and that can be, you know, one of, the, one of the clips that they have to watch, and then you come back together in a synchronous way, and you um, debrief that, or you could have the actual SME on for, um, for Q&A. One of the things um, that we did in that um, in-classroom experience, and when I talked about breaking up into triads, right, so you had 
someone act as the um, the employee, someone act as the client, and then the observer, right? And then you trade roles. And they were practicing delivering what we call their positioning statement. Like, why should you do business with me, with my company, right? So it's your kind of elevator commercial. In, in a best case scenario in the classroom environment, they may get to practice that a couple of times and get feedback, but only feedback from the two other people in their group. Um, in this case, we actually, they just use their webcam on their laptop, or if they had a laptop without a webcam, they use their um, uh, personal device, and we have them record themselves delivering their positioning statement. And then they uploaded that positioning statement into our learning management system where we could create little communities or cohorts um, for that class. And, um, and then they would get feedback from everybody in that cohort and community. So their feedback increased tenfold. They're getting feedback from 20 people. Um, the managers of all their participants are jumping in. So they're getting peer feedback. They're getting manager feedback across geographies. And let me tell you how many times they practiced and re-recorded themselves before they uploaded that video. So they're actually, again, increasing their practice um, because they would have done it live, like I said, maybe twice in the classroom environment, but they certainly don't want to upload that video unless they feel that they've really got it right. And so they were sharing stories about, I recorded it 10 times before I um, uploaded it. So talk about the repetition and the reinforcement um, and so that's just a small example of what we've done to kind of, try to take that two or three days, um, definitely break it up into to small chunks, give them time to go offline, do things, come back, talk about those things, um, you know, break out in groups, give them group assignments to work offline, come back and they present as groups. So similar to what they would have done if you would have broke them into um, collaborative assignments in the classroom, they're just doing it offline via, you know, Zoom, WebEx, um, conference call, uh, and then coming back and presenting, presenting virtually versus presenting, li presenting live. So there's actually a lot that you can recreate in that um, asynchronous, synchronous environment um, that doesn't necessarily lose the effectiveness of that in-person experience and in, in some ways can, can actually maybe be a better experience than that in-person opportunity. Great. Uh, your uh, point about uh, reinforcement, I had also one experience about one of our customers, you know, uh, thinking of, because there is a uh, forgetting curve, right? People take the training, mm -hmm. Few days they remember it, but after yeah. five days, seven days, 14, 21 days, they forget it. So, how to reinforce uh, important concepts in those uh, gaps, like nudge them with uh, important nuggets? Um, that's what uh, one of our customers introduced, and that uh, increased the recollection value uh, that uh, yeah. in the online learning mechanism. So, so yeah, let's uh, move on to our. Uh, Next topic, now that we have touched about uh, on uh, delivering multiple methods, the, the one of the most important points is about engagement and collaboration. We all know how important it is as a part of uh, creating an online course. If it's not engaging and collaborative, then it defeats uh, the purpose. So, so let me go to uh, Clive straight away uh, and ask him like, what's his tip for organizations for creating uh, online learning that is engaging? So you've done so many courses, you've created so much, you've created a great platform. So what, what, what's your secret? Yeah, what is our secret source? Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's multifaceted as always. There's, there's probably about six or seven key components to making things engaging. Uh, the first one is give them a reason. You know, whatever it is that you're talking about, even for the, for the panelists today, let's give a reason for people to attend this. Make sure that the tips and tricks that we're, we're providing actually have impact. It's the same with the training. Make sure that we're, we're fitting them to the interests but what we see the most important thing is to tie it to the, the learning and the career pathways. A lot of the most successful L&D leaders that we've, we've seen and we interview and, and, and share your panels are the people that really understand how to get from this, I don't want to say from A, it's more like you know J to M. How do we go forward in our, this culture of learning, this continuous improvement? And we've had a lot of people cite that uh, humans are just built for growth and for development. So 
tie every engagement, every session to moving in that direction, moving towards a promotion, moving towards more knowledge, moving towards more application in Excel, in Python, in whatever it might be. So give them the outcomes of what we're trying to achieve here, tie it to that. The other thing is really what Kim was talking about in the previous session, make it collaborative. Have some kind of a peer, um, particularly with the leaders, Kim mentioned it, I'll back it up, make sure that they're involved. If you see your boss heavily involved and dynamically uh, motivated to, to this session, it really does have an impact. The other thing um, that Wesley mentioned earlier on in his session was this idea of gamification, what we would call kind of experience points that the millennials know from video games, from, from other activities <laughs> that they're doing, build these badges, these bronze and silver and gold, mm -hmm. attribute, um, you get 10,000 points if you complete the micro masters, and maybe you get 2,000 points for a professional certificate in these subjects. So really give them, I want to keep going. I want to build up my points against my peers and with my peers, have team experience points. So some kind of badging awards gamification really does kind of lift um, the sessions and, and make it impactful. The other thing, of course, is not, and I mentioned this earlier, when I've taken courses um, on some of the, the platforms that we all know that take five minutes and there's no assessment and there's no real you've got this at the end of it, I just completed it. You just think, oh, okay, that's fine. Um, might not want to do that again. I didn't really feel as if I got anything out of it. In a lot of people talk uh -huh. about these participation awards. Well, what we're trying to do is make the particip participation award transferable. So you can put it onto your LinkedIn profile, you can put it onto your resume, uh -huh. that you've got a certificate from Stanford, from Columbia, from Harvard, from MIT, from Oxford or Cambridge. And boy, does that really make an impact to not only what your resume looks like, mm -hmm. but how you feel, how you go to those job interviews, how you sign those application forms and whatever, what other credentials do you have? And you're quick to type in, I've got the Harvard, the MIT and the, and the, the award, <laughs> whatever it might be, because you worked for that. You earned that. You went through some really engaging, fun times with your colleagues, but at the end, you get something. And boy, does that make you work for it. Boy, does that make you want to make sure that when you do answer those questions, that you do get graded, that you really want to succeed. And if you want to succeed, and Kim put it so beautifully, you do record that video, not just once, not just twice. Uh, we had a course in selling and the, the, uh, the course uh, instructor uh, made sure that every single person that went through that course videoed themselves doing their qualifying calls and all the, the BANT uh, session that they learned in that course. And exactly the same, we all watched each other's um, selling um, videos and it makes you want to work harder. It makes you want to succeed. And that goes all the way back to where we, we started with this is make sure that the growth um, connections that our brains have and desire to improve are fulfilled. Don't just give them the, the, the five minute ones that, okay, we'll tick that off for diversity. We'll tick that off for uh, now you know how to build a go-to-market strategy. No, let's actually build the strategy that takes two or mm -hmm. three weeks and then it's usable. It's a, applicable in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. that, that, those are interesting tips of how you are approaching um, the development of these online training programs and how organizations should, should do that as well. Uh, Kim, I think uh, you, uh, Lana, um, handle a very large team and they are across geographies. So how mm -hmm. do you uh, encourage partis participation across ge geographies or across uh, divisions? Uh, what's, what's your uh, take on that? Yeah, we actually have been able to increase, um, I, I would say, critical partner engagement um, in our offerings since we've gone virtual. And so um, the reason being is if, you know, if there is, for example, your, you know, let's say head of strategy, right? So you've got your one head of strategy. Um, it's not realistic to ask them to come physically speak at, you know, every single offering of a particular program, right? So, 
they may not be readily available. They may be traveling. You may be offering the program in a different geography. So that is the nice thing that has also um, occurred as a part of kind of moving everything virtual is it's much easier to get those key critical partners to be willing to pop in for a five, 10 minute segment. Um, and it, it's, so much more impactful and meaningful for the participants to be able to hear directly from that critical partner than uh, potentially the facilitator relaying, um, you know, this is what this group or this person thinks, right, and believes. It, instead, you're getting to engage directly with that critical partner. And, you know, as far as kind of the, the cross geography and, and people from, you know, different parts of the country, um, you know, that was something we talked about in, in prep for our panel today. You know, one, it obviously depends on the topic and the commonality across those. Um, but again, the, the move to the virtual environment has facilitated that in a much easier and more efficient way. Um, and we've been able to um, increase engagement because it's just not as hard and it doesn't take as much time out of their, out of their day. So that will be something that we have to contend with. Um, you know, when we go back to in person, um, you know, one of the things that we're trying to push with our IT partners is improving the video teleconference capabilities in all of our classrooms and conference rooms so that, you know, we can get that same experience if the key partner can't participate in person that, you know, you've got, a, you know, you've got a strong enough infrastructure that, they can still pop up live on the screen in the room um, and, you know, at least have a similar experience to what it was like when we're when doing something 100% virtual. So we've got to figure that out so that engagement does not decrease once we get into whatever our new normal is going to be. Yeah, that's interesting. I think when we are in this new mode, how to still get the same level of uh, participation. And uh, I mm -hmm. think that when we, we were trying courses at institutes and uh, uh, professors teaching, they would say, uh, you learn less from the professor and more from the class. So, right. so that kind of, uh, that we have to make sure is enabled in the online uh, setting as well. So uh, one more quick uh, comment, uh, Clive, if you have about how collaboration activities, uh, you know, can bring about more engagement, if you have a few quick tips on that. Yeah, so what we hear from a lot of our partners is that they've got these kind of private cohort discussion boards. So the platform has them, they're using Slack, they're using the in-house um, materials so that the materials that they're producing for these assessments are going to be used. They're actually these how-to documents, these walk-through documents of how to program code, how to do go to market, doesn't matter what it is so that you have something tangible that has been created as a team. This, it's this document that is very specific to your organization, your bank, your insurance company, your NASA, whatever it might be, so that you have materials. And that's another thing that you as L&D people can take to the people that have your budgets. Hey, look, as a result of this course, we've got all these materials that we can have as dynamic working documents. They're not just scratch pads anymore, they're actually built with, with real genuine um, thought and process behind with the agile. Now we're into the arts and the pips because of what we've just learned. And this is what we've got for the product um, for the next two, three years. So having the team go through this together, collaborate on these documents, and they can send those documents as one. They can all get graded on the same thing because what the, the, the lecturers, what the teaching assistants are doing is just making sure that you've got the principles of agile and lean and so on and are able to apply them. So you can cooperate, you can collaborate on that information. And that's really what keeps people together. We talk a lot about reskilling, but we also talk about retention, retention of knowledge, retention of people and retention of the dynamic of culture of learning. So if, if, if you find that people are collaborating on these documents together, you'll get more documents done. Um, so there's th those sorts of ideas that you can incorporate into these courses. Yeah, those, those are great tips in terms of increasing the collaboration around these activities. And, uh, you know, I'm sure some of uh, the L&D folks will, will be listening and uh, taking notes on that. So uh, moving to our uh, last topic, which is... Uh, which is about aligning online learning with business outcomes. And 
I think this is this is so important because for all businesses, they want to spend money on online learning. They want to create this experience. But what is most important that CEO is asking is that, is it really making a difference? Uh, can you show me the analytics and, and so forth? And uh, Kim, uh, I'll go straight to you with this question. You are from banking and everything you do has a return on investment. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I think it's so important. So who better to tell us about how, how are you approaching uh, uh, this whole return on investment on online learning? And also, I'll ask one more follow-up question to that. Maybe you can cover that as to what metrics you are using to justify your spends and in, uh, in this uh, creating this on online learning experience. Right. Most learning and development professionals are familiar with Kirkpatrick's um, measurement model, and, and you know what what I have found is. Uh, the business is not as interested uh, in that. They want to know, um, you know, how did you specifically um, change or improve a, a behavior or performance? And um, I agree with something Clive said a couple of segments ago about starting with the end and starting with the outcome in mind. And we were forced um, a, a few years ago, um, we had another big expansion effort and, um, you know, our highest volume, highest turnover, entry level, non-exempt, so um, hourly employees, um, we, we tripled in, in population um, through this growth strategy we had. And so it no longer um, was efficient or effective to say, we've got to like fly or drive or bring these people in, in person to a one week, two week um, course to get them up to speed in their position. So our, our business outcome was how do we reduce cost? How do we reduce training time, time to productivity, but how do we either maintain or improve quality, reduce errors, reduce calls into the help desk, um, like with new hire um, questions. Um, and so we, I know we're running low on time, so I'll fast forward to we successfully completely eliminated our classroom um, offering. We build a simulated online environment with um, certain, I think Clyde mentioned too, experience um, check-ins and experience points. Um, they had um, virtual or in-branch coaches that would check in with them. Um, and at the end of the day, um, you know, we, we had to go back to leadership and, and say, you know, did you get the return you expected? What did you spend to develop this program offering? Did you reduce costs? Did you reduce training time? But more importantly, how was the performance in the business? Did, did you suffer in quality error rates? you know, calls into the new hire environment. Fortunately, um, we, we hit positive A plus on all of those fronts. Um, and I think that kind of leads into your, what your next question was around how do you gain support for the, those investments? And, um, you know, I found particularly in banking um, or, you know, whether you're in really, no matter your industry, if you're talking to the CFO, you're talking to the C-suite, you know, numbers and data speak. Right. So, um, you know, what's it going to cost us to do this? Now, tell me how you're going to positively impact my business using um, using terms, data and metrics um, that I use in my day to day business. They're not quite as interested in the number of people you train, whether they really like the training or not. All they, they want them to like it. But ultimately, did you come back and did you did you sell more? Did you close more deals? Did you um, you know do you have better manager capability? Um, you know, are 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 is are your leadership skills uh, improved? Um, and you know, again, Clive mentioned assessment, pre post, um, all of those things. But what I found has worked the best is being able to put those success metrics in the terms of the metrics that the business uses to measure their own success. So how does your learning program help drive um, what they measure and deem as success, not necessarily what we in learning might deem as success. Yeah, Kim, thanks. Those were many points that you covered there. And I'm sure if people have noted even four or five of them, uh, they can really make a difference and deliver it to their management and executive leadership of how they can do better on the metric side and deliver ROI in their online learning investment. So uh, I would like to thank both you, Clive and Kim, uh, 
for sharing so many important points about you know how to approach an uh, agile upskilling program and uh, if you're designing online what what are the different tips when it comes to different types of uh, methods you can use how to add engagement and how to measure ROI so um, it was very interesting uh, hosting both of you and uh, sharing this uh, dais and thank you very much and I'd like to now probably we are out of time but uh, if anybody has any questions more than happy to take them uh, offline so that uh, okay. uh, we will answer them over, over to you, you Bob. Yep. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, unfortunately, uh, we are out of time. So, but uh, we can get these uh, taken care of um, offline. And for people that want to go back and review this session again, uh, it was fantastic. Again, we're going to keep the link open till November 29th so people can jump back in. So, um, again, uh, thanks so much, guys. As expected, great discussion about time allocation, ROI. Uh, synchronous versus asynchronous learning and, and having collaboration activities to encourage the engagement. So um, this opportunity on behalf of the audience to uh, thank you guys again for joining us. Thank you, Bobby. Bye, Kim. Bye, Clive. Thanks, everyone.